My name is Jenna Coins, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Church of Sharon, Sharon Interfaith Action, and Brockton Interfaith Community. On behalf of BIC, I stand here this evening to welcome each one of you to tonight's celebration. Thank you for choosing to be here. As an interfaith organization, BIC is inclusive of people of all spiritual backgrounds, including those who don't identify with any particular religious tradition, yet whose lives are fine examples of faith in action. Why was I personally drawn to BIC? I was looking for an opportunity to expand my circle of connection outside of my bubble, realizing we seem to be living in a world of separation rather than a, a world of unity. I wanted to do something to heal this divide and joining BIC seemed a natural fit. And what did I find? A community of people who shared my concern about the current state of affairs and wanted to work for positive change. The gifts I've received working with, with this committed group lead toward profound growth. I'm honored to be a part of this organization of social change makers. I'd like to share a brief poem that describes BIC. The moral arc of the universe is long and it bends toward justice, said Parker, Martin, Jacob Cohn, and recently Barack. Believe this prophecy, despite the current tragic state, which seems to tilt away from God's trajectory of growth. Remember this, where there is breath, there's hope, a gentle guide toward balanced grace, a fragile place, from where we'll yet again lean forward, bending us toward justice. Together, we are strength, gathering as breeze, a wind of collective breath. We inhale communally the power of God's love and overtake the space of hate, replacing fear, exhaling peace. For this, let's live courageous days awake in prayer, offering each breath to bend the moral arc again toward justice. Thank you, all of you current BIC members, former BIC members, and future BIC members, and also to the friends and family gathered here tonight. Thank you for your generosity. And I'd like you to just take a brief moment to focus in gratitude upon the gifts that each person brings into this world simply by being born. Breath by breath, may we recognize life's fragility. May we coexist peacefully upon this planet. May we each expand our circles of relationship, knowing that love thrives in a welcoming space of abundance rather than from a mindset based in fear and scarcity. May we celebrate and cherish the beauty found in our diversity as we live intentionally generous lives, freely sharing our gifts in relationship together. Hi, I'm Janet Schmidt. I'm also from the Unitarian Church of Sharon and Sharon Interfaith Action and Brockton Interfaith Community. I'm going to share with you the credential of Sharon Interfaith Action, which in a sense is telling you what is Sharon Interfaith Action. Our many faith traditions call us to love our neighbors and to work for justice. Sharon Interfaith Action, or SIA, was created in 2017 to reach across economic, racial, and class divides to develop relationships and partner with those people most directly impacted by injustice. SIA is currently partnering with BIC in an evolving process of listening, learning, growing in power, and taking action together. Personally and collectively, we commit to standing with and learning from the people of Brockton. Brockton Interfaith Community and Sharon Interfaith Action have found common cause in turning conversation and envisioning into action here and now. We have joined together to work for justice in the funding of the Brockton Public Schools. This work has led us into conversation with other organizations, both regionally and statewide. 
Connecting with others is our path for building power and delivering justice for those suffering from its absence. Um, my name is Emily Lem. Um, I attend Brockton Covenant Church, and I'm a prophetic leader with Vic. I'm going to read the Brockton credentials. Brockton Interfaith Community, founded in 1990, is a multi-faith, multi-ethnic, non-profit organization from the greater Brockton area. Our mission is to work collaboratively on issues chosen together to promote racial and economic justice through prophetic, faith-rooted community organizing. We advocate at the state level as MCAN and at the national level as Faith in Action. By building power locally through intentional relationships, we aspire to create systems and structures for the purpose of establishing a more equitable and just world. BIC has carried out its mission successfully through the 2018 passage of a major criminal justice reform bill, as well as is its participation in the implementation of school discipline reform in a local high school. This year, BIC has also worked to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and to secure paid family and medical leave for thousands of families across the Commonwealth. Currently, BIC has chosen to focus energy and resources on education and funding reform. This issue is chosen by a process of deep listening to the members of the community. Thank you. My name is Debbie Bowman, and I am a prophetic leader at Broughton Interfaith Community, as well as a mom of three teenagers. Please award me for that one, because that's really difficult at times. And my, my awesome husband is up back as well, Richard Bowman, so. And um, as well as the other hats I wear, I'm treasurer of Christ Congregational Church, so welcome to my church here. And as well as I'm an owner of my CPA practice, um, Act CPA. And so as my daughter will tell you, and oh, Audrey, um, Audrey's also been joining me, so most people know Audrey. She, she tells me all the time my favorite three topics to talk about, politics, religion, and money. Can you imagine that I actually found an organization that loves to talk about it? And not only that, we can actually do it safely. We can actually know that we can have a conversation and not worry about someone hating me or starting a fist fight or, I mean, this is, this is power. I mean, and then we not only take those three topics, but we throw in some power and we throw in abundance and we get a recipe for complete success. This organization is a complete success. And that is why I'm excited to be in this room tonight. Tonight, you're gonna hear not only what we've done, but where we are today as an organization and where we're gonna go in the future. And I can tell you, I'm extremely excited about what this organization is gonna do in the future. And, <clears throat> You know, one of my favorite words is abundance because I, I'm a money person, I'm a money coach. And as a money coach, um, abundance is something that you have to tune into and you actually have to figure out a way that you can broadcast it to, to into your life. I call it prayer, call it meditation, whatever you want, but way, the way you bring more abundance into your life is by really calling upon it. And tonight we're gonna focus on, again, um, talking about money because we are an organization that deals in abundance and power. And, it, and that's how we build power. And we build power with people. It was a concept that I learned this year when, we went, when I attended the SOPA trainings, the School of Prophetic Action. So I encourage you um, to pay attention. We've got some phenomenal speakers coming up and I want you to really listen to what is really happening at BIC it's exciting. This is a fun time to be a part of BIC. If you're not active, I'd encourage you to, you know, just jump in like I have. Um, and there's one more thing that I wanted to say, but uh, let's see. Oh, yes. Actually, well, I'll give Jenna the honor. Yeah. 
Okay, um, I would like to invite Dave Capozzi to introduce our board members, the current and the future board members. Pastor Dave Capozzi. Good evening, everyone. Um, just so you're aware, um, we're a little bit rowdier of a group than that response just uh, <laughs> indicated, so I will say it again and give you another chance. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, beautiful. My simple job is just to uh, sh introduce you to the board members of Broughton Interfaith Community, uh, and so I will do that. But I just want to say something really quickly about William Dickerson, who's our executive director. Don't worry, it's not going to be too much. I'm just, Will, Will was brought into a situation that was really difficult and uh, quickly assembled a board that I have been really honored to be a part of. And uh, this board has worked really hard to enact and, and uh, call people to the vision that Will has set before us as an organization. And it has been a, a true gift to be a part of this, this group of people that you're about to be introduced to. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce the board to you. Um, first, we have Reverend, uh, sorry, just Pastor Manny Daphnis from Restoration Community Church. If you could just raise your hand, he's got, got a baby, not his baby. We have uh, Reverend Patricia Hayes, the pastor of this church here. We can see her later. We have uh, Rabbi Randy Kafka, who's over here, and she. Um, she and Rabbi David Jaffe are the co-founders of uh, Sharing Interfaith Action, and they joined our board uh, this year, and it's been a real gift as we, as we partner with Sharon. So Rabbi, and Rabbi David is not here with us tonight. Uh, and I think that's it for who's here. And I would also like to recognize Bishop Teixeira, who up until recently fa uh, served faithfully on our board and uh, has, has uh, put his efforts into other things right now, but he was a tremendous asset to our board and a great friend of Big for a very long time. Okay, that's, that's uh, a bunch of clergy who um, get the stage a lot. So now I get to introduce to you uh, the three new board members of Big who are not clergy people, but are prophetic leaders and have proven over and over again through this year uh, that they are capable of leading multitudes of people and have done a tremendous job at uh, putting in action the things that they've learned through the School of Prophetic Action trainings. So first, I would like to introduce to you Eugene Kavanaugh from Restoration Community Church. You can stand, Eugene, come on. Can you stand? And then we have Shelley Corbin from Brockton Covenant. And finally, Anne Marie Ilsley. Where are you? Yes. So you've effectively just met at least most of the board of Brockton Interfaith Community, and uh, I just want you to know that on on the board's behalf, it's an honor to be with you all tonight, and I'm very excited for where we've been and where we're going together. All right. Uh, who am I introducing? Yes. Ah. Pastor Manny. Um, Pastor Manny Daphnis is going to now lead us in a faith reflection. I can promise it's going to be good because it's Pastor Manny. Everyone, please welcome Pastor Manny. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, we're so excited that you're here on today. And um, I've been given a charge to share a brief faith reflection upon this evening and I want to first and foremost just take a few moments to simply acknowledge the fact that in the room there are folks from all sorts of different faith traditions and while you know it's important that we come together in times like this it's certainly important that we honor and are respectful at the same time I simply want to let you know that I'm going to be sharing from our particular faith tradition, my particular faith tradition, and I pray that you hear it from that spirit. And before I go into text, I actually just want to jump in and share a quick story that illustrates this fact so poignantly. Recently, 
Her church is on the east side of Brockton on uh, Crescent Street. And we're on the corner of Crescent and Quincy Street. And further down on Quincy Street is an elementary school, the Baker School. Y'all are familiar with that part of the city. Um, they were partaking in a food drive uh, just before Thanksgiving. And they reached out to us. And we were honored that they reached out to us. And so we shared with the congregation, hey, Restoration, we got invited to partake in a food drive. Are you willing to share what the Lord's given you to help those in our city? And uh, members were like, yes, let's give. And so, you know, we, 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 a couple Sundays passed, and folks brought what they brought, and we were able to share. But that last Sunday before the food drive was to end, um, we took a little offering towards um, what we were going to sow to the Baker School. And in the offering was an envelope. Envelope was from a woman at her church who was in a shelter, didn't have much of her own, but what she put in the envelope was her food stamp card. And she wrote a little note. She said, I don't got much. Here's what I got, and I need you guys to contribute to this food drive from my food stamps. Initially, we were like, no way. How in the world can you who don't have, you know, <laughs> give? But the truth is, that's the exact point, right? You don't necessarily need to have an abundance to give. You need to have a heart that earnestly desires to give, to give. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 21 that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And the question that we have before us here is this. If we understand that we're charged to give, yet we don't give, where is our treasure really? Is our heart really connected earnestly to living out the mandate of being a giver that we're charged to live out? We are to live to give. We are to live to give. And when that becomes a reality, make no mistake, friends, the world is a better place. In a lot of ways, I'm sharing and teaching to the choir, if you will, right? You know, the fact that you're here is a testament that you understand that, hey, my life is to be an example of one who gives so that the world can be a better place. But is that earnestly our reality? Today, my charge to you is really simple. I simply want you to Take an introspective look at you. Are you truly living to give unto others so that our world is a better place? Or are we simply doing what we're charged to do and moving on thereafter as if our impact and reach to our broader world can't be affected if we don't have the mindset that we're truly here living to give? Thank you, and God bless you. Right. Rabbi, Rabbi Randy is up next in our one-to-one. -one. Can we uh, welcome Rabbi Randy? Hi, everybody. It's good to see everyone. It's just so wonderful to be here. OK, so here's the thing. You, most of you know this already. Building personal relationships is at the foundation of community organizing. It's underneath everything that we do at BIC and at Sharon Interfaith Action is having conversations one-to-one. -one. So we're going to loosen that 
a little bit, <laughs> I've had this conversation with Will. We're at a round table, you know, you can have a one-to-one -one and then somebody on the other side of you can listen in. If there's an odd number of people, work it out. But the point is to have a conversation with someone at your table. And I've put these cards on some tables, it's not actually a tent, it's a little sheet. So look around, I know there's a lot on your table. So this is the first instruction, find the card that says, ask me. Okay, and this, you'll need to share this at your table so everybody has a chance. There are four questions here to ask each other. You get to pick which one to start with. You get to pick how many you want to do. There's a lot of freedom here, okay? But the point is to have a conversation that's more than simply, you know, what did you have at Thanksgiving or whatever. I mean, we did those conversations already, so now we're gonna get into a little more substantive conversation. Hi, everybody. We are going to continue with our program, but I do wanna, you know, just invite you all to continue to enjoy your soup if you wanna get up for seconds or thirds or fourths. Um, feel free to do that. Uh, my name is Kristen McNevin. I am a prophetic leader here with Brockton Interfaith Community. I attend Brockton Covenant Church, and I am here with my husband and my four beautiful girls who are probably running around, and at least the little one is wreaking havoc, I know that. Um, so sorry in advance if she approaches your table. Um, so I just was, want to tell you all a little bit about what we've been up to in 2018 and kind of the story of how we got to where we are this year. 2018 was a busy year for Brockton Interfaith Community. That's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> Early in the year, the need to rebuild became obvious. So BIC does what BIC does best. We got to work. Will Dickerson, our executive director, began meeting with clergy and faith leaders throughout Brockton. They committed to meeting together six times, and through this, a clergy board was born. This was the first step in shaping what the rest of the year would look like for BIC. Around the same time, Will became acquainted with Rabbi Randy and Rabbi David through our parent organization, Massachusetts Community Action Network, Rabbi Randy and Rabbi David represented Sharon Interfaith Action, and they still do. Sharon Interfaith Action was looking to build ties with a city that was close to them, both in proximity and in values. Through a series of meetings and a process of building relationship, Brockton Interfaith and Sharon Interfaith found that we clicked. It was decided that Sharon Interfaith would join us for a powerful training module called the School of Prophetic Action. It was around this time that Vic welcomed Ryan Chasey as an intern who several months later would assume the role of community organizer. Yay, Ryan, we love you. Will and Ryan set forth to educate and train over 70 individuals from congregations in the city of Brockton and in Sharon who are interested in joining the fight for racial and social justice. I was among them. In these amazing training sessions, we learned grassroots organizing techniques, how to listen to the concerns and needs of our community, how to express why we were doing the work that we were doing, and even learn techniques to become better public speakers. We learned that we don't need to use our energy to try to move those in power. We needed to move the people, and the people would move the power. Most importantly, we learned how to turn our passion and our anger into action. We began having one-to-one -one meetings with each other in order to better know and understand one another. Little did we know that these early one-to-one -one meetings were teaching us how to connect with the community around us. Once we were comfortable, or still uncomfortable, but at least familiar with how to have a one-to-one -one meeting, it was time to start having them throughout our congregations and our community. We asked people what their hopes and dreams were for themselves and their families. Then we asked what barriers they felt were standing in the way of achieving those hopes and dreams. We listened, and we listened, and we listened. 
we conducted over 700 one-to-one -one meetings. Then we came together right here at Christ Congregational and brought forth the information that we had gathered. We shared the barriers and fears of those that we met. We compiled them into categories and then we voted. The first issue that we would affect would be education funding reform. It was time to put our training to work. We broke down into smaller research action teams. Each team was tasked with meeting specific individuals such as representatives at the state and at the local level, members of city council, members of school committee. We asked questions, we listened, and we learned. On October 10th, we gathered over 200 congregation members, community members, and community allies in the sanctuary of Trinity Baptist Church. We shared what we had learned. We heard powerful testimony from Bronctonians and from Sharonites. We invited local and state politicians to join forces and work together to find ways to better fund our schools. We gained a lot of support. We formed follow-up committees that are currently in the process of determining our next steps in the fight for education reform. And we are gearing up for a 2019 full of hard work, connecting with our community, and positive change. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the man responsible for coaxing the inner leader out of all of us here at BIC, who pushes us to dig deep, and then even deeper, and then even deeper, to become the very best version of ourselves. The beating heart of Brockton Interfaith Community, my good friend and mentor, BIC's Executive Director, Will Dickerson. Now that she said all that, I feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack. I'm so nervous. Thank you for those kind words. I asked her not to do that. Um, I just, I, uh, I just wanted to come up um, so that people could see my face. <clears throat> um, as was stated, my name is Will Dickerson. Um, I've been uh, community organizing for about six and a half years now. And a year and a half of that was spent with so many of you beautiful people that are in this room now. And as I sit and I look at all of these beautiful faces, I am starting to ask myself the question, what should I say? When I, one of the first things that we uh, talk about um, in the training that we put together called the School of Prophetic Action, which is the training that is designed to pull out the leader in an individual. Um, as we, we ask ourselves um, this question, why are you here? And the reason that we ask ourselves this question is because I believe that we are all here for a purpose and we are all in this room, in this space, in this second in time, and in the next second in time for a reason. And that oftentimes we don't ask ourselves the question why. And that moments pass by where we ought to be leading, we ought to be changing the world, merely because we did not ask. This is important to me because the way I got to this place in this time is because I asked myself the question, why one day? Why am I here? What is my purpose and what is my calling? And it was, a, it was oh man, it was 10 years ago when this conversation started happening for me. Many of the, uh, the school of prophetic action leaders in the room will recognize a word that I say. Um, the word is ekbalo. Y'all recognize that? Can I hear you? Yeah. So the ekbalo that I'm talking about, it's a Greek word. Um, and the word is a word that, that really means to thrust out, to push out, to, um, to, uh, to move someone, thrust somebody into action 
but it, it has this connotation to it with the notion of violence, like a violent thrusting out into the world. And we talk about this from the perspective of like the fact that I believe in my own faith tradition and the ways that I'm called that God is constantly creating ekbalo moments, thrusting out moments for us to go into the world. I share many stories of the different ekbalo moments that have happened in my own life. The one I want to talk about is one that I was thinking about when I got here and was the first time I heard the word ekbalo. So for, for those of you all that weren't a part of the School of Prophetic Action, hopefully you'll enjoy this, but I'm talking to my leaders right now. Because what ended up happening is that a pastor got up and the pastor was a confirmation for me. Um, I come from a, 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 a tradition, uh, well I don't come from a tradition, but I was in a church that comes from the tradition of uh, like prophets being in the, um, in, the, in the pews and a person came up to me and prophesied over me and she made this statement. She said that you are going to go into a place and be a leader of mighty people. And she said that the most important thing for you to remember is that at that time is that God is going to tell you to go. And when God tells you to go, it's time for you to leave. The reason that this is important is because fast forward three years later, I'm in a room and this pastor is preaching about Iqbala, distrusting out. And I kid you not, as he's preaching about this word, this, this word, Igbalo, and I'm zoned in and I'm listening to him, he looked at me and he said, God is telling you to go right now. And he walks away and he continues to keep preaching. And I'm like, what? As if it, as if it was just me and him for a second. And so I was like, oh, maybe it's just a happenstance. And the pastor comes back to me and looks me dead in my face, says, God is telling you to go. It's time to go. Unfortunately, I didn't listen when I was supposed to listen. You can laugh. <laughs> the reason I think that it, that it was important for me is because I started to realize that God was talking to me. And I use this language not to make folks uncomfortable in the room, but hopefully to draw you into your own faith tradition and the ways in which you see the world and to start to figure out how are you being called in the world now? When will you respond to your Ekbalo moment? So you fast forward years later, and there's one more calling, but this calling is a lot more clear, uh, a lot more clear than the one that I got before, and a lot more violent. And it was when, it, 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 was, it was when the, uh, um, particularly Michael Brown was killed. When Michael Brown was killed, for me, and for my family, that was devastating. And it was devastating for so many different reasons. But the biggest reason for me was that I had nephews, I had cousins, and I had family members, not only in the age group of Michael Brown, but, I, but they looked like Michael Brown. They could have very well been Michael Brown. And I felt myself feeling helpless. That there was nothing that I could do to protect my family. There was nothing I could do to protect the people that I cared about most in the world. And I wanted to give up. And it was in that moment, in that time, that God called me and said, you don't get to give up now. Now it's time for you to fight as fiercely as you can. I'm here in this room because not only have I decided that I'm going to fight fiercely for that little boy back there and that beautiful woman back there in the corner, but that I'm going to fight fiercely beside and with and for anybody that wants to see a better world, a more beautiful world, a world where all people are accepted for however they look, where love abounds, and that not people but hate is squashed out. That's the world I would like to build, and I hope that others would like to build that world with me. So right now, I want to invite some beautiful people up. Some beautiful people to tell some testimonies about the work that we're doing in getting to this place of building the world that we would like to see. So there are some folks that are going to give some testimony. Come on up, Eugenie. Come on up, Eli. Come on up, my beautiful wife. You're all beautiful. 
I want to make sure that everybody knows. <laughs> and they're going to share some powerful stories about some of the work that we're doing and what it's meant to them. We'll start with Eli. My name is Eli Silverzweig. I'm a prophetic leader with Sharon Interfaith Action and Brockton Interfaith Community. Can you hear me all right? <clears throat> is this better? Yeah. All right. Making education accessible to all has been one of our family's central values. My grandfather was an assistant principal in Harlem and the principal of an evening school which taught immigrants English. My father strengthened vocational education in Massachusetts at what is now DESE and as an assistant superintendent. My wife teaches children with dyslexia and other challenges how to read. Like Reverend Dr. King, my dream is for people to judge our children, all of our children here tonight, not by the color of their skin or by our hometown, but by the content of our character. I attended Sharon Public Schools, and I had a phenomenally positive and deeply impactful experience. At age 16, I became a student activist, and I was given the opportunity to speak about public education funding at the Massachusetts State House in front of 5,000 people. Two years later, I was elected the student member of the school committee and used my seat every meeting to ask questions and add student input. These were immensely empowering experiences for a young person. Growing up in a house ruled by an autocratic, tyrannical step-parent, uh, empowerment was not what I was used to. And in today's environment of constant shouting demonizing others, and daily character assassinations broadcast across every medium and directed against whole groups of people, empowerment is not something that many of us nor many of our children feel often enough today. But there is one place I feel truly empowered. I'm part of something great, part of a movement that brings together diverse people in, in common brotherhood and sisterhood, in shared values and a shared desire to repair our broken world. It is in this very building, in this room that we are tonight, as a member of Brockton Interfaith Community. Nearly a year ago, I came here for the first time to help choose the issue that we should focus on in 2018. I had countless conversations, both one-on-one -on -one and in large groups, with people whom I had never met before, who I now consider my brothers and sisters. Their passion, determination, perseverance, and commitment inspires me. It lifts me when I am down. We learn, and we strive, and we grow together. I'm so proud and honored and blessed to be part of this community. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Sakarian. I'm a prophetic leader with BIC, and I am also honored to be the wife of William. So tonight I'm sharing my testimony about why our co-op work is so important. And the first thing that comes to mind is when we think about the work that we do. If we're lucky, then often, hopefully, our work is an expression of the things that we care about, right? Right? Yes. If we're lucky. So you get to be a teacher, you get to be a doctor, you get to be, you're told when you're a kid, you get to be whatever you want um, to be. But the truth of the matter is we know that there are a lot of hardworking people to where their life's work, the thing that they would um, prefer to be doing, isn't always the thing that seems within grasp. And so the co-op work that we're doing is about helping people to recognize that if you're working two, three jobs, then more than likely there's a gap between people understanding what your talents are and utilizing them in a way that is 
um, the fullest expression of who you're called to be. It makes me think of um, the, way script, the way in my faith tradition that scripture opens up with the book of Genesis. In Genesis, we see that each and every person that's created is created in the image of God. It says, male and female, he created them. This thought that each and every one of us has this expression of divinity in us. And if we're created in the image of the ultimate creator, then one of the most divine acts that we get to participate in on a day-to-day -day basis is what we create, what we do, how we serve in the world. And so this thought of co-op work that allows people to recognize their fullest potential and to be able to serve, to do, to create in the highest expression of their talents, the highest expression of their identity, their passions, that that's always going to be a plus for community. And so how I'm personally bought in um, to this notion is by thinking about the fact that right now I get to um, primarily be the one who's home with my son and thinking that I didn't grow up in a household where that was the case. And I think to myself, Lord, when in the world did you know I get put in, in this position? And not that we're any more blessed or not blessed than anyone else, but recognizing that it's a privilege that comes with my husband coming to a job that honors his talents, honors um, his abilities, his capabilities, and knowing that there are jobs that people go to day in and day out that don't do the same thing. And so what I love about our co-op work is that it's not about people um, being angry and demanding something that they quote unquote don't, don't deserve. It's about people recognizing that everything that they want, everything that they possibly could set their mind to want to be, if you want to stay home, want to stay home with your kids, if you want to um, you know, do carpentry work, if you want to do something else, that all of that is within reach if people start to take ownership of what their work looks like. And I'm not sure if I mentioned earlier, but for anyone who's not familiar with the concept of co-op, um, cooperatives are existing all over the country, and they're about people saying we want ownership of the work that we do instead of going into a, um, a job where there's a hierarchy in terms of how we think about um, leadership. So there's no boss. Everybody who you know, works in the store, owns, shares in the store. So everybody's um, the boss and leadership is made together. Decisions are made together. And so I really want to think about this revolutionary way of helping people in Brockton make the connection that that's something that can happen right here. So for anyone who wants it, that it's possible. And so I think especially for our family and now being a mom and thinking about what is, what is it that I want to um, where is it that I want to raise my son? Um, what type of understanding of work and power do I want my son to be oriented to? Knowing that that's something that was so distant for me as a kid, something that was so distant for me even when I was in college in terms of thinking about the type of work that I was going to do. And so it's powerful for me to think about being in a city um, that can be really revolutionary in terms of thinking about how these co-ops can look in a very urban context. So my hope is that if you're not already involved in the co-op work, that you ask some questions, come out to some meetings, um, hear more about what we're up to, and yeah, preferably see you guys at the next co-op meeting. Good evening. My name is Eugenie Kavanaugh. I'm a prophetic leader with Brockton Community Interfaith as well as Restoration Community Action Ministry. I am a mother to two beautiful, handsome boys that are very smart and intelligent. I am an alumni from Massasoit Community College with a major in Human Service. I currently attend Bridgewater State University and mastering in social work. I have completed three modules in the School of Prophetic Action training. Tonight, I did not know that they were going to ask the questions, why am I here? But that's what, I'm, what I am stating, why am I here? When I was asked those three, that, that question three different times, we had to go deeper, each time giving a different response. So for me, I am here because the voice for those that are facing the same experience that I had faced for a single mother unable to afford childcare, making only enough to feed my children and not myself, working two jobs. I still found myself homeless for two years 
sleeping in my car, or at shelters. Silenced by my attackers, as I became a victim of sexual assault by a coworker, being kidnapped at gunpoint, being raped and beaten without proper justice, only because the law could not find his gun. This is why I'm here. I am here because upon returning from Iraq, I saw a society for that I fought for that is being enslaved to a social system with a dominant narrative. A dominant narrative that tells a story, I am poor because I am not working hard enough. The color of my skin and ethnicity are not worthy of equal opportunity. Because of my gender, I do not deserve equal employment opportunities. A story that places my two sons at higher risk for the, for the school to prison pipeline because of the color of their skin. I am here because as a 13 year combat veteran with one deployment, I saw the price of freedom while transporting soldiers that were dead during the Afghan war. Watching countless times as coffins were being uploaded onto my vehicle containing someone's son, mother, daughter, child. All that gave their life for the price of freedom, equal right to life, and equal opportunity. I am here because the price that all soldiers, whether killed in action, missing in action, physically and mentally wounded, or returned home unarmed, invested into America to have a freedom of equal opportunities for all. For me, Brockton Interfaith Community is a place where I can work from my past and present pain. So our own future, as well as the future of our next generation, will not suffer greater pain fighting against equal, unequal opportunity. A place created where all can walk in their expression of faith towards community and social justice. Leaders that stand up for righteous anger and radical love to people in power. I would like to leave you with a quote from the passage of the Bible. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. This is from Psalms 82, verse 3. Thank you. Before we, um, before we get to um, the conclusion, this beautiful pastor right here, it's her birthday, it was her birthday yesterday? Can we just honor her, love on her? I won't ask folks to sing, because that means I gotta pick the note and I'm sick right now, we not gonna do that. Can't do that. Y'all wanna sing? Yeah. yeah, let's sing. Somebody else pick the note. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Hayes. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Yes. We had a love on you. We had a love on you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do before they take this mic from me um, for the night is you all have all this wonderful soup and desserts, right? And people are coming and cleaning up after you and washing these bowls. I'd like to just honor the people that volunteered their time and their love to make this thing possible. We can do better than that, right? We can make some noise, right? This is wonderful. We just wanted to honor you all. I know you're out back there seriously working. And it is a true blessing, and we want to make sure that you're honored for it. So, you next. Right, so I'm going to tell you about the bowls. Um, we had this notion of the soups, and we wondered what we would put the soup in, and we came upon the idea of decorating bowls. So, many people in this room have taken bowls, have decorated them, we have Sign sealed and delivered. We baked them to make the paint stick properly. We recommend hand washing, but we do say take your bowl home. 
And if you see another bowl that you really like, take that home too. Just don't knock somebody over to get theirs. That wouldn't be right. You can trade, yes. Yes, but there are some tables with extra bowls and please help yourselves. They're, they're kind of a nice reminder of the night. I have the honor of presenting uh, some remarks of gratitude to Central United Methodist Church. Amen. Central United Methodist Church housed Vic in all of its various meetings for about a quarter of a century. Hello. That's a long time. And we are so grateful for that uh, uh, sharing of their space, the, giving, the gift of their hospitality, and grateful um, for all that they contributed to BIC throughout the years. And I understand Comfort Corning is here. Comfort? Yay! And we have a, a token here in a pretty bag. The red one. Hi. <laughs> As you make your way through, this is great. And we just did this with a lot of gratitude for all the wonderful years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Tracy Gutierrez. I'm the internal organizer for Rock and Interfaith Community. And I would like to say a special thank you to Christ Congregational Church for letting us have our office space here and for all of the wonderful support that they give us. And we are forever grateful for it. And I have to give a special shout out to Reverend Patricia Bill, <laughs> for all of his help, and Dina and Keith, because throughout this whole process, they have been amazing and so supportive and have gone above and beyond. So I have this very special gift to present to your congregation. I get to receive it. You get to receive it. Here comes Michaela. Oh. Good evening. Um, my name is Michaela Latour. I am a prophetic leader with Brockton Interfaith Community and a member of Restoration Community Church. Um, I grew up here in Brockton. And I'm here still with my husband, who's also a prophetic leader with Vic, and our three children. Um, my husband and I became involved with Vic in January when we began um, attending the School of Prophetic Action. And we've engaged in all the education work and the co-op work that um, other people have talked about tonight. And that work really changed us. And it changed me. I've always had a really rebellious spirit. Um, <laughs> and, um, but because of the way that I interpreted the scriptures, I spent a lot of years just trying to repress that. Um, and uh, going through the school of prophetic action, building deep relationships, allowing those relationships to agitate me and push me, I realized uh, I realized that that spirit was really a gift. I realized that that spirit was put in me to make me who I'm meant to be, to drive me toward my purpose, to harness that spirit and organize it into vision and power and leadership and action, to drive me to do the work of challenging the way things are and make them the way that they should be. This work really changed our whole family. So my husband is this handsome man back here, Habo. 
Um, <laughs> and um, he just has this um, natural way of just taking over a room when he comes into it. But really, for a long time, he just didn't know what to do with that. And um, doing, uh, doing this work together, I've experienced this beautiful journey of my husband growing from a man just, just learning how to follow to a man lead, who's leading his community um, and growing from a man who picked up a mic and got really small to a man who picked up a mic and challenged power. And what's more beautiful is that our children have experienced it. They know their parents are leaders. And so leading and organizing, working, building, challenging, pushing, it's become normal to them. That's the most beautiful thing that can happen. When our kids, when our collective kids, when a generation of kids believe it's normal to build the world they deserve, the world as it should be, in my faith tradition, that's when we believe heaven comes to earth. I want you to visualize that. What does that look like? Love, equity, justice, empowerment. We're doing that. Our kids are going to do that. And their kids are going to do that. It requires a legacy of this work becoming normal, of holding power becoming normal. We're creating that. And I need to tell you the number one reason that my husband and I are able to do this work and that so many of the other leaders are able to do this work is childcare. I'm so thankful that we're able to do this work and have our kids with us because BIC hires child care providers. They love my kids and my kids are excited to come with us. And, they're, and, and when they come, they're becoming connected to the work that we do. And that's part of the legacy. It's part of normalizing the work for them. And it's something BIC hadn't budgeted for this year. And it costs. This work is urgent, it's imperative, and it costs. It costs time, it costs energy, and it costs money. It costs money for childcare, so families can do the work. It costs money for translated materials and interpretive services, so that people can learn and participate in their native language. It costs money to staff and organize and grant scholarships for those who want to learn and attend trainings and can't afford it. Power is organized people, organized stories, and organized money. So I'm inviting you tonight to organize with us, to build power with us by sowing a seed. I am so thankful you are here tonight and have committed your time to being here and have donated through your ticket. And I need you to take one step further. I need you to commit with me tonight. I need you to commit to sowing a consistent seed, a monthly seed. Because where you sow, you reap. And the harvest is life or death. If you don't sow the seed, the harvest is death for you, for me, for community. And when you do sow the seed, the harvest is life. The harvest is beautiful. The harvest is a life, a community, a world, transformed a world as it should be. A world worthy of our children, of the ones that we love,